Well, thank you everyone for joining. My name is uh, Trevor Tyler. I'm the Senior Director of Beverage Operations for Eureka Restaurant Group. Um, uh, closest one to Cal Poly Pomona would be our Claremont location, but we do have uh, 24 locations um, across the United States, mostly in California. And we have uh, four locations out of state, one in Las Vegas, Nevada, one in Seattle, Washington, one in um, Austin, Texas, and another one in Boise, Idaho. So uh, just a little bit about me, I, I graduated from the Collins College in 2009 um, with Lara and um, started with Eureka in 2011 uh, as a general manager, uh, was a GM there for a couple of years and then took over the beverage program in 2014 and uh, started with the company when we had three restaurants. Now we are all the way up to, um, 24. So it's been a, a fun, exciting time and uh, had the pleasure of learning a lot from uh, uh, Michael Godfrey, who's on this call, which is cool to see. Uh, he kind of took in, taken his class in college, um, really kind of jump started me and, and my love for beer. Um, back then, my philosophy was to uh, sit next to the people that looked like they hated beer so I could drink their leftover samples. Uh, <laughs> uh, sorry, Mike, I don't think uh, you probably caught on to that, even though I thought I was being sly. Yeah, it was, um, I uh, thought it was wise. Yeah. <laughs> um, but so for today, we're just going to talk about uh, beer in general, the process of um, making beer briefly, uh, and then touch on the history of American craft beer, kind of where it started, some of the dark years. Um, and where we're at today. And then we'll round off uh, with a tasting. We did. We were selling a four pack from Ambitious Ales at our Claremont location. So I know a few people did pick that up, but if you don't have that, that will be available um, at, at our Claremont location in the coming weeks as well, if you wanna pick that up. But um, hopefully that's, you have something to drink tonight. Um, I know James is sipping on some field work, so that's always good, but yeah, leave a comment on what you're drinking, and uh, if you have any questions, we'll we'll go from there at the end. So, um, I guess I'll just share my screen now. All right, so I think everyone should be able to see my screen. Um, so, really briefly. If you remember from college, we talked about the brewing process. Uh, we're starting with uh, barley and we're gonna uh, soak that and let it germinate. Uh, that's gonna, uh, germination is just when that, uh, this, the seeds uh, start sprouting. Once you start sprouting, we're gonna dry that out uh, and kiln it. Um, that's just roasting the grain. Then you're gonna go into the malting process um, uh, and mill the grain down to like a fine starch powder. Uh, that's then gonna go into your louder ton or your mash ton, uh, where you're gonna create like a porridge um, type uh, solution. Uh, you're gonna boil that, extract all those sugars from the grain itself into you know this uh, liquid. Uh, after you separate the solid materials uh, from the liquid, that's called your wort. Uh, then that's what is gonna go into your kettle to add hops. Hops are added at different uh, parts of the beer making process. Um, early edition hops are uh, a lot for flavor. Late edition hops are for uh, more aroma. Uh, you also have something called dry hopping that can be done um, to add even more aroma to the, to the beer. Uh, we're gonna go into a whirlpool where the hop particles are separated from the, um, the beer itself. Then that's gonna go into the fermentation process depending on what type of beer we're making. We're either gonna be using ale yeast or lager yeast. Uh, we'll talk about the differences between ales versus lagers just very briefly. Um, but there's only really two main types of beer. And then there's there's the ale umbrella, then there's a lager umbrella. You have some styles that kind of mix, but for the most part, you have ales and you have lagers and you have beers that are fall under those two categories. So depending on what type of beer we're making, we're going to determine the type of yeast we're going to add. Uh, lagers typically uh, ferment for a longer period of time in the cold, colder temperatures, ales, uh, ferment for a much shorter period of time at um, a little bit higher temperatures. Now, most craft beer 
up till recently, um, the majority of craft beer produced by brewers were ales and they had very few lagers in most craft beer portfolios. The reason behind that was um, like ales are much quicker to produce. There's a shorter fermentation time. So if I'm a small brewery and I only have one 30 barrel system, I want to pump out and you know, I only have four or five fermenters. I want to pump out beer as quick as possible because I want to sell that beer. Also, the, 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 the demand, the clientele uh, for craft beer is predominantly shifted towards ales versus lagers. But you see kind of a shift now in, in craft beer, I'd say over the past four or five years where more breweries are dedicating fermentation space to lagers because um, the, they're trying to convert more people from your macro uh, beers to micro, my, micro beers or craft beers. Um, and a good way to do that is to introduce them to something similar to what they drink now or with a macro beer and introduce them something on the craft side. I think a lot of seasoned craft beer veterans also have made it known that they want more easy drinking, um, sessionable beers, not these huge seven to 10% uh, IPAs, which are great, but you know, you want to be able to drink more than uh, one or two beers in a, in a setting. So uh, I'm getting off on a tangent, which I tend to do. So, but going back to the uh, a brewing process after uh, fermentation, you're going into maturation. That's where you're going to maybe um, do some cold crashing or some other techniques that maybe get rid of some um, off flavors in the beer. Uh, depending on the type of beer you're making, you can filter filter this beer. A lot of uh, larger breweries have things called centrifuges, which is a, a machine that spins the liquid very very quickly and separates any solid particulate. Um, from that beer, but a lot of beer is unfiltered as well these days. Uh, uh, flash pasteurization, so a lot most craft breweries don't pasteurize their beer, especially beers uh, that you want to age. Once you pasteurize a beer, um, it does not get better with time. While most beer is designed to be drank fresh, lagers, IPAs, um, uh, pale ales, uh, there are certain styles of beer, barrel-aged stouts, lambics, um, where those wild active organisms in the beer can mature with time and actually develop more flavor profiles, just like a wine would age with time, you may get a beer that um, certain type of beers do get better with time. So most craft breweries do not pasteurize their beer. Uh, that is more of a um, macro uh, style brewery uh, procedure, and that's just to preserve shelf life. Um, and then obviously packaging going into kegs, uh, bottles, cans, so on and so forth. Uh, best type of packaging for a uh, craft beer is uh, probably cans, in my opinion, if you're outside of kegs um, or uh, if you're not doing cans, brown bottles. I think the general population has been much more, it used to be, I, I felt a lot of people associated something in a can with something less of value. Now you're seeing a lot of breweries embrace the can and can art is a huge thing in craft beer right now where Sometimes I, I, <laughs> I feel like certain breweries put more effort into the, 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 the art on the can than they do to the beer, but uh, uh, can art's a huge thing and definitely some cool can art in, in some great beer as well. Um, but yeah, that's just kind of a really quick run around of the beer making process. This kind of class, I didn't want to spend too much time on uh, beer making. Uh, if you want to do that, um, uh, maybe Mike will teach a class. Uh, uh, or Owen uh, here in the near near future about uh, home brewing. Um, so again, this is just kind of a, a diagram uh, that shows ales. Really um, simple diagram that shows ales versus lagers. Again, only really two types of beers: um, ales and lagers, and then everything falls underneath those umbrellas. So really, the main thing I want to talk about with this presentation is kind of just like how craft beer came to where where it is today uh, in American culture. And uh, in order to do that, we kind of have to uh, look back uh, a long time ago and um, see where beer was. Um, so kind of the early years of beer. So even before this happened, um, obviously a lot of rich brewing traditions were brought over from um, the, the from the colonies, you know, England and um, Europe had a very rich uh, history of, um, of brewing and, and beer styles. And a lot of that was brought over um, 
when America was founded. And unfortunately that did get diluted over the years, which we'll talk about in a minute, but kind of in the early years, it was a very booming industry. It was a very respectable industry to, to be a brewer. Um, very, um, <clears throat> what's the word I'm looking for? It, it, it was just a very successful industry. Obviously everyone <laughs> liked to drink as they still do. And there was a lot of respect behind it. Um, so like rich brewing traditions brought over from Great Britain uh, and Germany, um, even, even Russia, um, but we're a country of immigrants and that since the beginning and with being a country of immigrants, you bring over a lot of uh, different uh, traditions and recipes and, and that translates to beer as well. So in, in these times, it wasn't uncommon for, um, you know, when the men went away to work at the mines, uh, but the woman would stay home and, and, and actually brew beer as part of um, maybe some household duties that wasn't uncommon. Uh, during this time, we had the invention of artificial refrigeration, which uh, allowed brewers to, to actually brew during the warm uh, American summers. Um, pasteurization, which we talked about, extended beer shelf life, beer shelf life making storage and transportation more reliable. Uh, at this time, beer consumption grew but from 1873 to 1919, uh, beer consumption grew from 3.6 million to over 66 million um, uh, barrels. So then we enter into uh, prohibition, the Volstead Act, you know, the um, illegal production of alcohol. So this iconic image, I think you see every year around repeal day, which is December 5th, um, uh, 1933. Uh, we actually celebrate repeal day at Eureka every year with uh, uh, seven dollar. Uh, this year we're doing seven dollar Buffalo Trace old fashions. Um, so if you don't have anything to do on repeal day and you're near a Eureka that has uh, service, then come grab a seven dollar old fashioned. But uh, basically, prohibition made the production of alcohol illegal in the United States uh, under the 18th Amendment. At this time, we were in um, also kind of in that. The, in the in the Great Depression, so uh, small breweries shut down, um, and you know they sold their land. Uh, some large breweries were allowed to stay open under the Volstead Act. Uh, we'll talk about that, this in a second, but a lot of these breweries um, uh, were able to leverage certain relationships overseas with canning and bottle suppliers for non-alcoholic beer, um, because before uh, prohibition. Not, not and again, I'm getting ahead of myself, but people didn't have, even though refrigeration was a thing at breweries, not everyone had like a home refrigeration unit. Um, you had like a cold box. So a lot of, most of the beer consumption in the United States was happening at pubs. Um, if you were affluent enough, maybe you could buy a, um, a barrel to take home. Um, but most of the beer consumption was being, uh, being drank going out and, and not so much at home. Uh, so these large brewers uh, were allowed to continue pr to produce non-alcoholic beer under the Volstead Act or Prohibition, um, which would eventually prove to be to their benefit when home refrigeration became more widely available because they had these contracts with um, these bottle and canning suppliers where they would be buying in bulk and smaller breweries just didn't have that, uh, that luxury. So, the Volstead Act was amended in April of 1933 to allow the production of 3.2% beer. Um, and eventually prohibition was repealed on the 21st uh, with, the, um, with the 21st Amendment on December 5th, 1933. So uh, 1933 to 1945, uh, we have what I refer to as the reawakening. So really, even though prohibition ended, this really meant the, the end of small breweries in the United States, at least for the next um, 60 years. Um, well, no, not that long. I can't do math, but uh, <laughs> 40 or 50 years. I wasn't a math major, sorry. Um, so like I said, the breweries that were allowed to brew under the Volsedek had that upper hand. These were breweries like Schlitz and Paps and Anheuser-Busch, uh, which obviously Anheuser-Busch still being uh, a very big brewery today. Paps, uh, Schlitz, not around, but uh, I can't remember who Paps is owned by, but I know they're not, I know they're owned by someone bigger. Um, some small breweries that were able to open uh, were just unable to regain any competitive edge. 
um, and eventually went out of business. From 1935 to 1940, the number of breweries fell 10%. Uh, by 1945, total brewery uh, count dropped to 476. I have kind of a cool graph I'll show you at the end that kind of shows the timeline of, you know, the number of breweries in the United States. And uh, we are much higher than 476. I think there's more breweries in, um, there's almost as many breweries in probably San Diego County alone uh, that come close to that. But uh, also during this time, uh, brewers started trying to cut costs. And what, is, what does that mean? They were seeking out cheaper ingredients and what, could, what can you use to make beer um, other than malted barley? And they found that they could use corn or rice, which was a much cheaper commodity, more readily available. Um, it also had a higher fermentable sugar content, especially in corn, um, where they could uh, get some of, some of those, they could get uh, alcohol, they could get the yeast to eat the higher fermentable sugars to produce um, alcohol using less, actually less uh, of the grain. Um, affordable product resulted in beer consumption from uh, USA, from in the USA growing from 50, uh, growing by 50% from 1940 to 1945. But a lot of that was due to, um, you know, just producing a much cheaper product at that time and, and really didn't resemble um, what people knew as beer that came from those rich brewing traditions of Great Britain and Ireland and, and uh, um, Russia and Germany, of course, Belgium. So the United States was producing a lot of beer. People were drinking a lot of beer, but it wasn't good beer. It was cheap beer. It was affordable beer. Beer was very much considered and still very much today is still considered a very blue collar drink. And I think the craft beer industry um, over the past, you know, 20, 30 years has really fought that battle and, and trying to introduce beer as a high end beverage and saying, you know, you can buy a bottle of beer for hundreds of dollars, just like you buy a bottle of wine for hundreds of dollars. Um, and not everything has to be consumed in a uh, 30 pack that costs uh, $14.99. Um, but that's still something we've come a long way since 1945. But that's where this kind of all started with the um, macro production of uh, uh, pretty much American light lagers. So growth and consolidation from 1946 to 1978. So this is like, this is just a Schlitz ad that I, I like a lot. I just like the look of it. Um, uh, so from 1946 to 1978, total output of beer continued to grow in the United States, but the number of breweries consolidated, continued to consolidate. So people were drinking more beer, but we had less people making it. Um, and then that's just, again, to these macro breweries continue to grow and grow and pushing uh, small breweries out of business. Uh, and th during this time, the five largest breweries saw their uh, market share grow from 19% to 75%, which is absolutely insane. Um, the spread of home refrigeration, like I talked about earlier, helped spur consumer demand for canned and bottled beer. This caught draft beer sales to fall, which gave more competitive edge to those larger breweries that had those contracts with those bottle and canning suppliers um, where they were able to buy massive amounts of bottles and cans um, and sell to the market that now had home refrigeration. And that's why you see these, these type of ads here on the right of you know six packs being um, marketed uh, with the wholesome you know, Norman Rockwell looking-esque uh, gentleman at your local grocery store. The greatest name in beer, Schlitz. Uh, and so during this time, so we went from 476 breweries um, in the previous uh, kind of era to down to 89 by 1978. Uh, and this was a record low. Again, just 89 breweries in the entire United States. Like, think about that, 1978. It wasn't that long ago. Um, but uh, that's just crazy to think of. So 1979, uh, the game changer year, as I like to call it. So this is uh, President Jimmy Carter. Um, so Jimmy Carter is actually uh, credited with kind of uh, 
the the boom in home brewing in the United States because he was the one he was the president that signed the bill that made home brewing legal on a federal level, um, but states still have the right to deny it. Um, but really, he just signed a bill that had a lot of lobbying behind it by uh, two homebrew clubs in California. Uh, one being the East Bay Brewers that were based out of the East Bay of uh, California. And one of their main members was a woman named Ann Riley. And Ann Riley was a student at uh, Cal State Berkeley. And um, I actually heard, first heard of Ann Riley on the Brewing Network, which is a great podcast um, if you're a beer fan. And they're based out of the Hop Grenade in Concord, California. But they interviewed Ann Riley. It was really interesting to hear a story about going into, uh, you know, being an illegal home brewer in, in the Bay Area in the in the 70s and going into wine shops to buy yeast uh, to make beer and um, literally having signs in the in these shops that say please this beer this yeast should, cannot be used to make beer home brewing is illegal and um, she you know got this homebrew club together they um, lobbied and got this bill all the way to the, the president's desk and, and he signed it. Um, so a lot of people, uh, the other the other homebrew club was called the Maltos Falcons, which were based out of Southern California, and they did a lot of lobbying to get uh, the ban uh, the homebrewing legalized on on a federal level. And now I, um, I believe homebrewing is legal in all 52 states, but there are restrictions per state on how much beer you can produce a year on uh, as a home brewer. But um, still. Home brewing wasn't legal always in, in the United States, and uh, Ann Riley and, and these two clubs were really uh, beneficial and um, vital in getting that overturned. So uh, one thing I did find um, recently that I, I need to stop sharing my screen, I think, so you can see me. Um, not sure if everyone can see me, but so Jimmy Carter's brother, I wasn't alive at the time, but Jimmy Carter's brother is named Billy Carter. And Billy Carter was kind of known as like the black sheep of the family. And right around this time that Jimmy Carter like lifted the, or made homebrewing legal on a federal level, Billy Carter came out with his own beer. And my uncle always told me about it. It was called Billy Beer. And it was pretty terrible from what he told me. And I was in Palm Springs this past weekend and I found a can of Billy Beer. And it says, I had this beer brewed up just for me. I think it's the best beer I've ever tasted and I've tasted a lot. I think you'll like it too. And then it has Billy Carter's signature. So as a beer nerd, I thought this was a, a pretty cool find. Um, it's empty, but um, my, my wife's like, why are you spending $11 on an empty can of beer? And I said, it's history, it's history. Um, so I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, so moving on, so Jimmy Carter uh, legalized homebrewing and uh, what happened next? All right. So 1980, that should say 2020, there we go. Um, so really some things happened when homebrewing was legalized. So in 1979, homebrewing was legalized. Um, but the thing is, when people were like, oh, I can make beer, they wanted to make the beer that they drank. And for the past 50 years in the United States, the majority of the beer that people drank was American light lagers. Now, people can hate on American light lagers all they want, but it's a very like stripped to the bone style of beer and they're very hard to make. Um, lagers of that style, there's not a lot, you can't hide behind hops, you can't hide behind a big malt profile. You you're tasting beer at its absolute basic. So anything, any small thing that's not done correctly in the brewing process, any lack of sanitation, um, like bacteria or anything, it's very hard to mess, or it's very easy to mess up. It's very hard to make. You talk to any professional brewer, they'll tell you the hardest thing about learning how to brew is making the same beer over and over again and making it consistently. So what most people did when they wanted to get into home brewing is they tried to brew an American light lager because they were used to drinking Schlitz and Paps and um, Budweiser. So they went to go make this and it was again, hard to um, hide any, any um, 
off flavors or um, mistakes in the brewing process, but there's a difference between when I'm home brewing and I'm giving all my buddies free beers. And then I say, well, you know, everyone says they like this. So I'm going to open up professionally. Um, so you had a few people that try to open, not a few people, quite a few people that try to open up their own breweries, but there's a difference between when you're giving things away for free and then when you're selling them. So when you start selling a product that's inconsistent, I think if you talk to anybody in pretty much any industry, consistency is king um, because if someone, if you're getting an inconsistent service or product or anything, you're not going to go back to that place. So you didn't see, you saw a lot of, there wasn't a lot of trust from the consumer in craft beer early on is because there wasn't a lot of consistency from the breweries that were opening up. So if I try out this, you know, local brewery that just opened up because this guy's been home brewing for a few months um, and you know, I go once it's okay. Then I go again. Oh, that was really good. Then I go again. Oh, that was, that didn't taste anything like the last time I was there. I'm probably just going to revert back to my old drinking habits and go back to um, the macro beer, go back to the, the Anheuser-Busch, the Coors, the Miller, that, that whole thing. Um, so the trust of the consumer wasn't there. Uh, and that's why it wasn't this big boom when home brewing was legalized. Uh, and it took a while for that consumer trust to build. So uh, some people that started getting it right, uh, this gentleman to the right here's name uh, on the slide is Ken Grossman, to me is arguably um, on the Mount Rushmore uh, of craft beer, um, probably along with Fritz Maytag from Anchor. Um, and then the other two I'd be up for debate, but I'd say those two are, are probably uh, solid shoe-ins for, for my Mount Rushmore. Um, so Ken Grossman uh, started brewing, he bought a, uh, if, I highly recommend his autobiography, which is very, very interesting, but he bought a homebrew shop in Chico, California, said his wife almost divorced him over it. Um, and he started brewing out of an old, um, like a milk farming kettle. And which is kind of ironic because a lot of breweries when they went out of business during prohibition would sell their kettles to milk farmers. So it kind of came full circle. But he started making a beer called Sierra Nevada Pale Ale, which I, to this day, I think, you know, people disregard Sierra Nevada Pale Ale and be like, oh, that, you know, that's a 90s beer. But it's still, to this day, I, I love a, a good fresh Sierra Nevada Pale Ale. Um, if you ever have a chance to go visit um, the brewery in Chico, California, it's an absolutely amazing facility. Uh, one thing a lot of people uh, don't know is they use all um, whole cone hops still to make all their beers at Sierra Nevada. They don't use hot pellets. Nothing against using hot pellets. Uh, tons of breweries use hot pellets and they're great, but I still find that so interesting that Sierra Nevada is still um, using whole cone hops and they actually have helped a lot of small breweries out getting hop contracts because of their relationship with hop farmers in uh, the Yakima Valley, the Pacific Northwest. Um, and uh, just Sierra Nevada is just a really great brewery. And I, I think they did a lot for the craft beer industry. Um, one of the biggest things uh, was again, talking about consistency, being able to provide a consistent product, being able to provide Sierra Nevada Pale Ale, which really wasn't like anything anybody had ever uh, drank at that time. They were using, you know, your sea style hops, Centennial, uh, Chinook, um, uh, Cascade uh, and just Sierra Nevada Pale Ale to me it, it was is just a revolutionary beer that, that changed the game uh, of craft brewing and uh, I feel like I work for Sierra Nevada right now because I'm talking about them so much but I I just think that beer is, was so vital in the uh, the history of craft beer in the United States um, not to say not to say there wasn't others but you, that really to me set it off and you started having breweries like uh, in the early 90s like Bells and, and Brooklyn and, and Stone and Maganitas and um, founders in the mid 90s and you just saw you started seeing these breweries pop up and um, so from uh, between 92 and uh, this that numbers that was from 2017 I have it corrected on the next slide but we went from 92 breweries in 1980 to now we have as of 2019 which was the most recent numbers released by the brewers association we have um 8386 um breweries i don't know if everyone can see my mouse here but uh, kind of just like what we we talked about you know starting here where brewing was kind of a, a very affluent industry in 1873 had it kind of die down a little bit you know great depression you know world war one 
Um, obviously prohibition here. This little spike here was probably around the time when the troops came home from World War II. So you saw a little bit of up in production, just, you know, the, uh, the troops coming home, celebrating. Uh, and then again, you know, just the economy wasn't a great space, just the, the rise of the American macro logger, cheaper products being used, less breweries, small breweries going out of business, um, record low here in the uh, late 1970s. Uh, and then again, that, it wasn't a huge pop here as far as the number of breweries. You know, homebrewing was legalized in 1979, but you don't see that huge jump. So it took probably about a good 15 years before you saw any type of, you know, boom. And then here in the late 2000s, uh, 2008, 2009 is when it really took off and you, you just started seeing breweries pop up left and right. And now you can't, uh, can't, seems like you can't throw a rock without hitting a brewery these days. And uh, uh, we live in a, a great time for beer. And uh, we're, we're very lucky than uh, compared to where we were, you know, 60 years ago. So um, this is just some other numbers for the craft beer industry. Uh, uh, so beer overall in 2019 was, was down 1.6%, but craft beer was up 3.6%. You see kind of this, uh, so what is craft beer? Uh, you know, what did everyone asks, what is craft beer? So craft beer is, def there's no legal definition for craft beer. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here. Um, but there's no legal definition for craft beer. The Brewers Association, which is based out of Boulder, Colorado, has a definition and it says it has to be at least owned by 75% of a, um, like a private business. So if I open it up and I own 75% of it, or, you know, my business, me and my business partner own 50-50, that's still a craft brewery. But the moment I sell more than 25% to a different uh, company or they acquire more, technically under the Brewers Association, uh, you're not considered a craft brewery. So I, there's their definition. I think there's a cultural definition that's much more gray. You know, Under the Brewers Association, breweries like Firestone Walker are not considered craft breweries because they're owned, uh, the majority of their company is owned by Duvel, which is a Belgian based company. But to me, Firestone Walker is still, maybe not eight, the 805 brand, but uh, most of their beers still, to me, resonate as a craft beer. So even though, um, you, and if you really are focused on supporting true American craft breweries and want to follow the Brewers Association uh, definition, uh, there's an independent craft logo on most uh, craft beers. So uh, look for that logo. If you don't see that logo, then that the Brewers Association most likely doesn't recognize that as a craft uh, brewery. But uh, to my, I believe the majority of craft breweries do have adopted that logo to put on their packaging to um, to uh, signify that they're a craft brewery. The other uh, definition that the Brewers Association states is that there has to be less than 6 million barrels of production per year in order to uh, be a craft brewery. Uh, I find uh, it used to be 2 million barrels, um, probably, I don't know if Mike, you remember uh, how long ago this was when they changed it, but Sam Adams was a big um, big contributor to the Brewers Association. And when they surpassed the 2 million barrel mark, they, from what I've heard, they politely asked the Brewers Association to increase the limit from 2 million to 6 million um, so they could still be classified as a craft brewery. Mike, do you have anything to add? I don't, I don't remember the year either, but I do know that that's kind of how it played out. So, because they were certainly a, a, a voice early on uh, in, in growing the world of craft brewing. Yeah. And now I just got my twisted tea samples from Boston Beer Company uh, <laughs> in my, that was on my desk and I can only laugh. And, and I, Sam Adams is great. Jim Cook has done a lot for the brewing industry and um, obviously partnered with um, Dogfish Head recently and, and they make really good beer too. So um, yeah, so that's kind of where we're at today um, with craft beer. I think innovation is um, at the forefront of the industry. Brewers are continuously coming up with new styles, um, pushing the boundaries, um, you know, the hazy IPA phenomenon over the past couple of years uh, has been interesting to watch. I think you talked to some traditional old school brewers that were very against hazy IPAs in the beginning, um, 
have maybe bit the bullet and adopted it because it doesn't look like it's going anywhere. But then you have things like, um, you know, session IPA was very popular at one point and that seemed to kind of fizzle out. I think sour beer had its um, uh, time in the time in the spotlight for, for some time. And I still love, you know, sour beer, traditional Belgian style lambics are, are amazing. Um, but uh, I think IPA is, is still pretty much king in, in the craft beer industry. Hops are what um, most craft beer lovers tend to uh, go to. But again, a lot of breweries, in the, I'd say in these past five, six years, based on uh, market demand, are making more lagers, making more sessionable beers um, so people can enjoy and uh, introducing new beer, new people to the craft brewing community. Um, yeah, so uh, I think I'll take a couple questions here, I think in the chat. Um, what may, are whole cone hops more expensive, higher quality hops than hop pellets? Um, yeah, whole cone hops tend to be more expensive. Uh, the pellets are definitely more, um, you use less of them because they're actually the whole cone that are made into powder and then compacted together. Um, but Sierra Nevada, I'm sure has contracts where I'm sure they get very good deals on their whole cone hops. But yes, in general, whole cone hops are more expensive than pellets. And again, nothing wrong with using pellets. Um, ton, the majority of craft beer, the majority of beer in general is made with pellets um, versus whole cone hops. What is my favorite type of beer? Um, I don't, I like all type of beer. You know, I, I, it's, that's really hard for me. Uh, really just, what's your, I think what's your favorite a, band while you're at it? What's your favorite band? <laughs> right? It's like, when, you know, yeah, it, that's, that, that's a good analogy. That's a good analogy, Steve. Uh, that, um, I think it's depending what you're in the mood for to use Steve's analogy, you know, I may not want to listen to, um, you know, that hardcore metal band, uh, when I'm waking up first thing in the morning, there's a beer for every occasion. There's a song for every occasion. Um, I, I think if Not I were to belittle the question, it's a, it's a great no, question. No, 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 no. I, I, question. I, I, I totally, get, I totally feel you. Um, but I, I, I tend to be in that bucket of, um, IPA drinkers. Um, you know, I think if I were, uh, gun to my head asked to choose, I, I would say West coast IPA, um, Traditional West Coast IPA is probably not that I don't like hazies, but I, I prefer a traditional West Coast IPA. Um, and a lot of great uh, people making West Coast IPA and beer in general. Um, but you know, considering I can I can talk about beer for probably another two hours, but I know we only got 15 minutes here, so I want to move. Um, does anybody else have any questions, kind of about the history or? Um, no, I think. <laughs> I had a, I, I had a good flashback. I loved your part about talking about consistency, because um, it actually reminded me of being at Cal Poly Pomona as a senior in 1992 when I graduated. So I took wines and spirits with Spike Lee. I don't think he was there very long as instructor, but he was a great guy. You know, really he made it fun. So as everybody on the call knows, you know, you take that class, you do French wines, and then the next week you do Spanish wines, and then you do cognacs, and then you do vodkas, and then here comes Beer Week, right? So. So we're sitting in class and Spike Lee talks about how great Budweiser beer is. And we all started laughing, right? You know, and when the laughter and, you know, stopped, he's like, well, wait a minute, let's talk about this. And like you were saying, to make a lager beer, which Budweiser is, it's incredibly difficult to get consistent. And he said, Budweiser makes 145 million barrels of beer a year. That's 41 billion bottles, right? <laughs> In 32 different, you know, breweries around the world. So, but we, you, you open a Budweiser in California, versus New York or versus Germany, it's the same. It smells the same, it tastes the same. So he says what they do on the volume they do is just absolutely fascinating. I've never forgotten that. I thought it was just great, you know? So it was a fun memory. I, I completely You talked about consistency in lager, you know? Um, so, you know, granted, I, I don't buy it, but it was, yeah, it, was, yeah. it was a really fun lesson. So anyways, thanks for that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so really quick, just tasting through some of these beers so that um, maybe a few people that did. So if you have a chance, please go check out um, Ambitious Ales at a Long Beach, uh, great brewery. Uh, just if you can't make it down to down to them, they do sell beer online um, through the store that you can have delivered to you um, and just overall a really great brewery. Um, but if you can't make it to this brewery, please support your local breweries. If, if they could use your support at any time, now is the time 
Uh, so um, this is uh, Ambitious Ales. This is their, their hike school. Uh, really quick, just talking about uh, pouring beer. You always want to pour beer into a glass. Uh, again, do I drink beer straight out of a can sometimes? Yes, sometimes, but you should drink beer out of a glass. The reason for that is you want to be able to look at the beer. You want to evaluate it. You want to be able to smell the beer. You want a good head on the beer. A head carries aroma. Um, it also expands carbonation in the glass. So when you drink a beer straight at, out of the can, none of that carbonation, it, it's all, the carbonation is all stuck in the beer. So that way when it hits your stomach, it, when beer hits a surface, it expands. That's why you get head. So if you drink beer straight out of a can, all that carbonation is expanding in your stomach, which is why people complain that beer makes them feel bloated and full. Well, if you poured it in a glass and allowed some of that CO2 to expand in the glass versus in your stomach, you would you'd be able to drink more beer and not feel so full. So um, the type of glass you use is also important. So this is a, uh, a lager. I'm kind of using a Pilsner style glass. Um, I don't have a, a traditional Pilsner style glass, but um, thin glass. So this is a, um, a lager that's hopped with Citra. Um, and more of a hot forward lager. I think um, breweries, again, craft breweries love, love their hops. Um, so I get a lot of citrus off of this, a little bit of pine, uh, obviously a breadiness from the, uh, the lager yeast, um, toasted bread, a little bit of fresh cut grass, but um, overall just a really flavorful, um, easy drinking, sessionable beer. So cheers. No, I'm not going to drink all these, obviously, maybe off camera when my wife makes me watch The Bachelor in about an hour. Um, <laughs> the next beer uh, I'm going to drink is the Central Perk, which is a coffee uh, Blondale. So Blonde, it is an ale, you know, um, top fermenting yeast. Uh, this is called Central Perk because of... It has coffee in it. It's named after the coffee shop in Friends. I'm not a huge show. I'm sorry if you like Friends, but I'm not a huge fan of the show, but I, a huge fan of this beer. Um, so I will show you kind of two things here. So if you can see in this glass versus this glass, and I did this on purpose. So this, you see the bubbles that stick to the inside of this glass? So those are nucleation points, um, which is where CO2 is clinging to a bacteria or some type of uh, particulate inside the glass. Now it's not gonna really make the beer taste terrible, but if you go to a pub or a restaurant and they pour you a beer where you have bubbles all sticking on the inside, they're not serving you in a clean glass. You want a glass that looks like this, where there's no bubbles that stick to the side and uh, no nucleation points. So this is a coffee blonde. Um, so obviously huge aromas of coffee. Like I just brewed a fresh pot. Um, they use Guatemalan uh, coffee and then Madagascar vanilla beans. So it's kind of like everything good about a, um, like a coffee stout, but not with that huge um, mouth texture. The mouth texture is very light. Um, uh, just notes of chocolate, tons of uh, coffee and a little bit of that, that vanilla. So um, good morning beer, good shower beer. I think if, if you've never had a shower beer, you haven't been living. All right. Um, third, we have their elevated uh, elevator business, which is uh, hazy IPA. It's a double IPA actually. So I did rinse all these glasses. So I hope this one was clean. Um, I have like a little Never mind. <laughs> I have like an elevated thing to keep my beer glasses uh, dried properly, but let's see if I did a good job cleaning this. Again, if you have those nucleation points, it's not the end of the world. Your beer is not going to taste terrible. It's just you want to serve beer in a beer clean glass. I think I did pretty good. I don't see any spots on the side. I like to drink IPAs out of a uh, tulip glass. Uh, they allow the head retention to um, have more life throughout the beer. Every time I drink, the beer is going to um, go throughout the tulip glass and kind of keep that head retention. That allows me to smell the beer with every sip, which um, your olfactory um, senses uh, 
contribute a lot to the overall flavor of the beer. So hazy IPA, again, it's murky, uh, almost like a, wheat, a traditional Hefeweizen or wheat beer, but it's gonna be, they use a lot of flaked oats and uh, the, the yeast style that they use is uh, specifically for hazy IPAs, which I uh, um, can't remember the gentleman's name, but yes, these, these, these are also often referred to as New England IPAs because they were originated um, at uh, the Alchemist in uh, Vermont, which makes, made Hetty Topper, which was one of the first um, hazy IPAs. Fun fact, if you read the can of Hetty Topper, it says drink from the can. And that's not because it tastes better from the can. They didn't want people pouring out their beer into, the, into a glass because they were afraid that people would, wouldn't like it because it was hazy. So they didn't want people to see the beer. Um, but you should still pour your heady topper in a glass if you ever get heady topper. So um, this has um, Amarillo, El Dorado, and the Bruce. So um, Amarillo uh, to me always has like this resiny orange um, note to it. I get a lot of peach, a lot of tropical uh, fruit, and then um, again that kind of like bitter orange citrus rind, but uh, hazy IPAs are, are pretty um, well known for low perceived bitterness. So even though they may have a decent amount of IBUs, international bitterness units, um, they're typically perceived as um, not as hoppy or not, not have as many IBUs um, because of those flaked oats and that mouthfeel kind of, and that yeast strain kind of uh, adds a thicker, heavier mouthfeel um, that people like a lot. So you get like a creamy texture almost, um, a lot of tropical notes. And uh, I love, I like hazy IPAs, but um, West Coast is, is usually my go-to. All right. I know I'm cruising through these. Um, I talked a little longer than I should have. Sorry. Like, shut up. We, why don't you, we want to start tasting the beer. Um, So this beer is actually really special to me. This is a, a collaboration that we did with um, Ambitious. So we, I went down and brewed the beer and then we aged uh, this beer in some bourbon barrels. This is a pastry stout um, that we added cinnamon, toasted coconut and vanilla to. Um, I think this beer tastes like uh, Coca-Cola. Um, it's absolutely delicious. And uh, again, we collaborated with uh, um, Ambitious to make this. So this is a pretty special beer. I think we do have some kegs still at Eureka, but uh, this is called Coconut Smoochie. And just a really big beer. Um, I think it clocks in around 10 and a half percent. Yep, 10 and a half percent. So dangerous, lots of notes of um, Coconut, cola on the nose, um, you get that cinnamon, that chocolate, uh, like a, a freshly baked chocolate cake. And then on a palate, I get oak, uh, a lot of those bourbon notes. Um, just uh, pastry stats are, are, are really, it's like liquid candy bars sometimes. Um, which some traditional brewer, brewers don't care for. But I think, again, there's a, there's a time and a place for every beer and uh, a good pastry stout with some uh, coconut, cinnamon, and uh, vanilla. I mean, I just can't argue with that. Um, so I think that's all I have for everybody, unless there's any questions. Um, I do wanna take some time just to let you, everyone know kind of some things that we're doing at Eureka um, that would help help us out um, right now with COVID going on. Um, so <clears throat> again, if you want this four pack, if you weren't able to get this four pack, it is still available at Eureka Claremont. Um, if you want to go buy it, uh, we're still open for patio business through Friday. Uh, but as of Friday, we're going to be going to to go only. Um, we do have some cool collaborations coming out uh, in the near future with homage out of Pomona, um, Stave and Nail out of uh, San Diego. We got some cool pastry stouts coming out with them. Um, Three Chiefs out of El Segundo, we're doing a collab with them later in the year. 
NorCal, we uh, just released two collaborations with Bear Bottle and uh, Ghost Town. We have a, a bourbon barrel aged barley wine coming out with Laughing Monk that will be available at uh, our, our uh, NorCal locations. And then if you love beer, but you also love whiskey, please look into our uh, Whiskey Club uh, subscription program that we started at the beginning of the pandemic, $75 a month. Um, you get a, a cool whiskey bottle basket every month that comes with a full bottle of whiskey and then some swag, some uh, cool snacks, a cocktail recipe, uh, personalized tasting notes from me. And then we do, a, one, we do like this virtual tasting um, once a month with our members um, where you get to learn about the, the, the whiskey, learn about the distillery, learn about um, the master distiller, the barrel, uh, the barrel master. We have different people on from uh, different, uh, have different responsibilities at each distillery. And uh, again, if you can't support Eureka right now, uh, just please, it, it would mean a lot to me. And I know uh, everyone at the Collins College and people in the hospitality service industry in general, support your local restaurants, order takeout, um, try to buy some beer from breweries, uh, try to buy some beer from like your local uh, beer bottle shop rather than uh, maybe skip a trip to Costco and, and, and buy some stuff from some local people. Um, but I really appreciate the opportunity Diana and uh, Lyra provided me to have this platform. I have a strong passion for beer and uh, I always like talking about it. And uh, yeah, yeah, Trevor, I, we have some questions in the chat if you want, uh, okay, if you have sorry. some time to hang out. Yeah, not a problem. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm not in any rush. I, I, if people want to stick around, I, I, I have four cans of beer to drink. I may start uh, uh, slurring my words a little bit, but I'm, I'm down to hang out. Like I said, the bachelor doesn't start for another hour, so I, my wife is good with me, uh, me sticking in the office chatting about beer. All right. Okay, let's start at the top. I'm not sure if you answered some of these. I've got a lot of kids in the background kind of running around that I'm keeping an eye on. Um, but um, are whole cone hops more expensive or higher quality hops than hop pellets? Yeah, I, we did talk we you did that about one. that okay. one. And that then I answered, beer. what's your favorite beer? I don't think okay. I got to any of them after that. The other one is about um, head. When your home brewing, is head supposed to get better over time? Mine seems to, why is that? um like better the head gets better over time in the bot like if the bottle sit for a while do you want to go off mute for that one no, I, I mean she may have some secondary fermentation going on in the bottle um that would yes. cause the head to uh the the, the beer the, there's active yeast in the bottles eating uh, organisms, I would be careful with that because you can have bottles explode. Um, so maybe just want to get your fermentation uh, techniques more honed in so you um, you don't have as much secondary fermentation going on in the bottle. Uh, Mike, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. You muted yourself, Mike. Yeah, sorry. So I think I think the other the other piece of the puzzle with that sometimes, and I speak from experience from my homebrew days, uh, is not having glassware as clean as it really needs to be when I'm bottling. So uh, sometimes when uh, every homebrewer's had at least one explosion in a closet or wherever you <laughs> try to age your beer, and. Uh, most of the people that I've chatted with, that was one of the things that they suggested. And so we started, we, we actually bought a few pieces of basic equipment to help with cleaning the inside of bottles. And that was a big help. Well, and then uh, we had a question about the last beer, um, the coconut smoochie. Does it have lactose? Um. I, I honestly think it does. I'd, I'd have to confirm that with the breweries, but m most pastry stouts have, have lactose. So lactose is a uh, type of sugar that's used. Yeast does not like lactose, they won't eat it. So it's a sugar that remains throughout the fermentation process that adds like a creamy, um, milky kind of, it's not actually, they're not actually adding milk to the beer. It's, it's a type of lactose sugar is a type of sugar it's being used. But I'm not 100% positive, but um, I, I think so. 
what's the name of the last one? Uh, Coconut Smoochie. Uh, so <laughs> Ambitious Ales names a lot of their beers after um, Adam Sandler movies from like the uh, 90s and early 2000s. So I uh, can't remember the movie name, but it was a scene with, I believe, Jennifer Aniston and Adam Sandler where they had to like put, take a coconut from their head to their or their toes to their head or something like that. Um, and yeah, that's where the name came from. Cool. And then the last question was about the water. Do you use municipal or um, reverse osmosis water? I think they treat their water. Um, I don't think they use municipal. Um, again, I, I'd have to talk. I, I, uh, I don't know that much information about Ambitious and, and what they're doing, but uh, I believe they're treating their water. Trevor, I've got, I've got a, another one for you. So one of the things that I learned as I was cruising around uh, my last trip in the Bay Area, um, and I, I have, about four years ago, I tried to voluntarily avoid wheat. And I started realizing after chatting with some brewers that a lot of brewers are adding wheat to what otherwise would generally speaking be a barley based beer because of the cost. But it's hard to determine um, who has beers with wheat in it without just flat out asking because it's not a labeling responsibility. Right? Yeah. So do you have do you have some thoughts about that? About is that is that fairly prominent as far as you know? I not that I know of. Um, I I actually that's the first time hearing that people are kind of using wheat as a means of saving costs. Um, I, no, I I to be honest with you, that's the first I, I've heard of it. I mean, most of the, most of the time I see people using wheat, it's um, to add, you know, body to their beer or, you know, they're purposely doing it for the quality of the beer versus trying to, to save a, a dollar or two. But um, no, no breweries that, that I've brewed, brewed beer with in the, the most recent projects we've done um, have, have used wheat. I just wasn't sure. I just happened to hear it like at three different places and I thought this is strange, so. Yeah, Thanks. no, news to me. Uh, does anybody have any other questions? You can take yourself on off of mute and go ahead and ask them. I have a quick question. Um, for a startup brewery with the, the whole market being so flooded with um, new breweries, what advice would you give to a startup brewery to differentiate themselves within the market? Or yes. now? Yes. <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> do it. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I get that question asked me all the time, like, why don't you open up a brewery? And um, it's, uh, it's such a saturated market. I think you, um, you see breweries now, even with COVID just going out of business. So, so regularly, it's such a tough industry to get into. Um, but honestly, like if, if you are committed to opening up a brewery and, and you know, you just want to open up a brewery, I, I would say just like anything, get experience, work under somebody for, um, if you're a home brewer, you know, try to work for free at, at a brewery on the weekends or, or volunteer your time and really learn about the ins and outs about making beer and um, don't go directly from home brewing to, to working on a, a, a large um, professional system. Try to get some experience under your belt um, before you, you just jump into it uh, full throttle. It's not cheap opening up a brewery. Um, and uh, again, it's a saturated market. So, um, you know, a, a lot of breweries have been successful and then they try to expand too quickly. I mean, you look at, um, you know, one of the casualties is Green Flash. Um, I think they're still producing beer. I think they got bought out by somebody, but um, that was a successful brewery. And then they tried to do nationwide expansion and they just tried too, too much too quick. And I, um, people always ask me, what was the beer that got me into craft beer? And it was uh, the Green Flash West Coast IPA. 
Um, I didn't like it the first time I had it, but my older brother said, you must enjoy this and you must enjoy to learn to enjoy it. But uh, that was a tough one to see. But yeah, you know, I think just like anything, you, anytime you're opening a business, you want to make sure that you, you know as much as possible and not to jump into things too quickly. And especially with craft beer right now, just being a, a saturated market, um, try to learn as much as possible. Thank you. Yeah. Trevor, this is James. A couple of questions. James. Um, any of those ambitious ales at the uh, Mountain View or Cupertino location? No, they don't have distribution um, quite yet. Pre-COVID, I would maybe sometimes uh, throw some SoCal beers, kegs in my car and drive up to the Bay Area <laughs> and, then, and then exchange them for some field work stuff to bring down here but um not not at the moment unfortunately but uh, they do have shipping in california all of california so if you go to their website um you can get cans and stuff shipped to you anywhere in california even if you're not in socal uh one beer I, I, my favorite beer from ambitious is their uh new zealand style pilsner which is called gandalf the crisp i it's my favorite pilsner um on the market right now I think all the beer they make is amazing, but that one's definitely my favorite. Thank you. Um, and then the second question, I guess I've always wondered, cause like I'm big into wine and well, spirits and alcohol and everything, but um, do you ever see like terroir or like very regional yeah. kind of becoming a big trend in beer? Just cause like Absolutely. yeast can be very regional, right? Sourdough That's... yeast from San Francisco is the most sour. Yeah, you know, 100%. Um, I mean, Bel uh, Belgian beer, Belgian style lambics have used open fermentation. Um, that was actually one of the earliest beers. I mean, you I talk about the, the origin of beer in, in Mesopotamia with Ninkasi, you know, that's how beer was made. It was someone left, you know, grain out in a, in a bucket and it rained and then they left it there and then wild yeast and organisms came and fermented it. And uh, that's beer at its, you know, oldest. Uh, you have breweries like uh, Jester King in, in Austin that source all that grow all their grain locally and, um, uh, you know, cultivate, cultivate yeast uh, locally. So yeah, terroir is a, a big thing, especially in um, traditional Belgian style Lambic beers and uh, open fermentation. Uh, I actually, uh, I'm not trying to promote our whiskey club still, but <laughs> we had a, uh, the, in November, we featured a barrel pick from uh, um Laws Whiskey House at a Denver, Colorado that actually uses kind of an open style of fermentation. And we did a barrel pick with them. And one of the most, the strongest characteristics that stood out to me was this kind of barnyard, like Brettanomyces funk to it that I just was not, I was like, I've never, I don't think I've ever tasted this in whiskey. And I thought it was so unique. And I was talking um, on our virtual tasting last night with the, the barrel master. And I was like, I, I don't know if I'm going crazy, but I'm getting like a Brettanomyces kind of barnyard funk thing going on here. And he's like, absolutely. Cause we, even though whiskey is a shorter fermentation period, they have a three day open fermentation where, you know, wild yeast strains um, uh, can get in. Um, and yeah. So terroir is Wait, who is that? Uh, it's their Laws, Laws Whiskey House out of uh, Denver, Colorado. Thanks. And it was their uh, San Luis Valley Rye. James, have you been to uh, the cooler in San Leandro? No, unfortunately. I, I most of the stuff in Cal in NorCal is San Francisco, um, Sonoma, is the most of the places that I visited. Well, if you're in, I mean, I've been to Drake's, but <laughs> well, if you're in San Leandro, so the cooler is a place in it and it's owned by two of our alums, Jeff Boats and Eric Kais, mm -hmm. and they they have a great cooling system, which is why they're there and they sit kind of in downtown San Leandro and they've got probably 50 to 70 beers on tap. They get everything in in just five gallon kegs. Uh, they've got a system where they change out every little line after every keg. I mean, it's a great program. But oh. one of the things that they have are some amazing beers uh, from California brewers that you just don't find in cans. Uh, and you'd have to otherwise go to the brewery to, to taste. So it's a great place to go. And make sure you let me know you're from Cal Poly Pomona. 
<laughs> I will definitely when whenever I can. Kristen and I will go. Yeah, I'll take you. I used to go there to study for my wine exams. I would always drink beer while studying for wine. And oh, did you, you did you meet Jeff or Eric when you were there, Kristen? I did, but I was with some friends, so I didn't get to fully okay. introduce myself. And it was after San Francisco Beer Week, so just a lot of crazy. Tell them, tell them hello, and tell them that you know we all know each other. And I will. They know my other bosses that I worked with too at a wine and beer shop. So well connected. Mm -hmm. Great place. And then James, if uh, I don't know if you've been to uh, the Rare Barrel in in uh, in Berkeley, but uh, on my list. <laughs> yeah. You haven't been to I the Rare Barrel either. either? Berkeley's just—I've unfortunately not been able to really explore Berkeley as much as I would should have. <laughs> I need to take you drinking. I, I went to Sonoma more often when I would actually drive from the South Bay. If you know, it's an hour drive, fifty minutes, fifty, yeah, whatever. So Sonoma ended up being more of a go-to then. I mean, Russian River and Lagunitas. I mean, come on. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Hey, James, is the Trappist still open in Oakland? I don't know. I think Kristen would be a better question. I've only they, been home for eight months, so. They were before COVID. Yeah. I place. haven't heard anything since then. Yeah. I haven't seen anything. I think I would have, but. It was great seeing you all. Yeah, well. Trevor, thanks so much. I have to go. Yeah. Uh, but great to Thank see you. you. Look up. Bye, all. Right, all. Thanks, Mike. <laughs>